Chapter 9 A Wounded Fugitive Joe Two Trees found his way to the far shore, and there Don was on a beach. He pushed the rowboat back into the flow and let it drift away. It would not be found to betray his presence. A grove of trees stood above the high tide line, and they would offer a temporary shelter. It was early spring again, and Joe felt a stirring inside when he noticed green buds and early sprouting shoots. The earth mother was awakening, and she would look after her lost woodland child. He spent the day in the protective cover of the trees and let sleep heal his body. When he woke, it was almost dark. He felt much better than he had in the morning. Opening the small bundle given by Tony, the boy ate some food. Soon he felt like going on. Tony's hand-drawn map led him in a southerly direction, and he followed it through the night. The land was mostly woods, but here and there he passed farms with buildings and livestock sheds. He avoided these, knowing that New York City was not yet far behind. Perhaps these people had already been alerted to watch for an Indian boy. He walked on until the waking birds began to warn of dawn. Before the light was full, he found a thick growth of bushes near a small creek. Shelter, water, and the food in the bundle were all he needed. This would be the next encampment. Seeing Rabbit scurry away as he approached, Joe made a snare. Soon the flint knife was cleaning a fat cottontail. Joe made a tiny fire, rotating a stick between his palms into a softer piece of wood and fanning the resultant spark to life. Shortly, a rabbit sizzled over the flames. That morning the boy had the first hot meal he had consumed in nearly seven months. He ate every scrap and sucked each bone clean. He slept again and later, when he woke, ate from the bundle. This was a good place, thought Two Trees. The rabbits could give food for a long time, and the water was at hand. He was tempted to stay and live in this spot. The idea passed as he reminded himself of Tony's uncle and the farm. He took out the letter and looked at its strange words. The boy wondered how marks on paper could speak from one white man to another. He shrugged and decided this was one of many mysteries in the world, mysteries he would never understand. The writing of words that speak must be a privilege of only important people such as bosses and shopkeepers. He looked at the letter until darkness made it futile. The words still said nothing, but he would continue searching for the man to read them. He wrapped his things in the bundle and cut a stick. Tying the bundle to it, he bounced it on his healing shoulder and started out. Animal eyes were all that watched him disappear into the misty gloom. The night was young, the ground was smooth, and Joe covered many miles before dawn brought the next day. As he walked, memories came and went. Long ago, his father had told him of this place. Although Eagle Feather had never ventured this far, he had been told of the island. Joe's grandfather, knowing that the Indian time was ending, had tried to tell Eagle Feather as much of his heritage as possible. The father had, in turn, told two trees. This had been, not so long ago, the land of the Delawares. They had been called Leni Lenape, which meant the real people. Joe wondered, as he walked, whether they had been like the people of the Turtle Clan. He judged that by now he had walked about the right distance. He would look for the uncle in the morning. A convenient brush patch served as sleeping quarters for the short time left until dawn. In that cloudy awareness, when one is not yet asleep, but not still awake, Joe saw Indian boys coming toward him. 
He thought he heard them say, Brother. But then he slept and the vision was gone. When morning came, he found a clear brook and bathed. The road dust had accumulated on his clothing, and he scrubbed these out against a flat rock. He spread the clothes on some bushes to let a spring sun and breeze dry them. It wasn't long before he was dressed again. Hoping he looked fairly presentable, Joe set out to find the farm. Beyond a grove of sassafras trees, smoke rose in a thin wisp. It must be a farmer's hearth fire. He walked through the trees and saw a farmyard. Pigs and chickens wandered about, and there was a man near the far fence. Joe decided to ask this man about the farm he was seeking. Surely, he thought, one farmer would know another. He left the woody cover and walked confidently toward the man. As he approached, the man saw him and casually reached for a shotgun, which had been resting against the split-rail fence. He didn't point it or even raise it, so Joe continued toward him. When he was close enough, the boy spoke a greeting. The man returned his greeting with a smile. The smile made Joe feel better. He had not been comfortable about the gun. Now he saw that the man was neither angry nor fearful. He was only being cautious. Joe could well understand this. Explaining his mission, Joe brought out the letter. The man said he had never heard the name Joe mentioned. He had been here only a short time, though, having come from New York City himself. He told Joe that he had not liked life in the city. The boy quickly agreed. It was partly in order to give a reason for his leaving, but mostly it was simple truth. The farmer looked at Joe's letter and shrugged. The foreign words meant nothing to him. I saw that Joe seemed weaker again and asked if he wanted to finish telling me his story another time. He rested a bit, sipped at the Indian tea, and said he would continue. I could sense that the telling was important to him. I listened. The farmer soon put aside his shotgun and seemed pleased to chat with the Indian boy. He said there was some work to be done. He would be glad to have his wife prepare a breakfast in return if Joe would help him for a while. They chopped firewood, split fence rails, and dug a garbage pit together. The man worked shoulder to shoulder with the young Indian. When they finished, the sun was already quite high in the morning sky. The man wiped perspiration from his face as he looked up, then joked that a late breakfast was better than none at all and they walked toward the house. When the door opened, the farmer's wife showed momentary surprise, but it quickly faded into a smile. Joe realized that her surprise had been over the appearance of two people on the porch, where she had expected only her husband. The fact that one had cinnamon skin had not caused it. These were better people on the farms, thought Joe. They saw a man, when, when one stood before them, not his exterior alone. These must still be children of the Great Spirit. He was very glad that this spot had been his stopping place. Perhaps the Earth Mother had directed his feet to this farm, this place of growing things. The woman moved rapidly around the small kitchen, and soon eggs sizzled with bacon, while biscuits added aroma. Platters were set on, rough -hewn, on a rough-hewn board table. When all sat down, the farmer bowed his head and spoke thanks to the Heavenly Father. Joe also gave thanks, thanks for a small good thing that pushed aside the darkness for him. The meal was served and Joe was familiar with eggs. He had often been sent to the swamp places in search of duck eggs when he was small. The bacon was new to him, and he enjoyed its strong flavor. Rolls, dipped with bees' honey, made a fine taste in his mouth. Cups of hot coffee washed down 
one of the best meals he had ever eaten. No time was allowed for sitting after breakfast, not on a farm. Sitting was done after supper, when all the day's work was finished. The farmer said this, and asked if Joe would like to work for more meals. The boy enthusiastically agreed, and they left for the fields. They hoed and weeded, carried water to the furrows, did all sorts of jobs. The animals needed water and feed. They hauled the feed out of a barn, the water from a well. The work was hard, but it was pleasant. Toward noon, the farmer's wife brought food in a basket. The two stopped for a time to sit under a tree and eat. Lunch done, they continued with the farm work. As afternoon shaded into evening, they went to a hillside pasture and led the cattle to their night quarters. When the light was gone, the day's chores ended. The two walked toward the porch again. They stopped in the yard to draw buckets of water from the well. Using this water, they washed away the dirt of a farm day. The two entered to the smell of roasting meat, potatoes, muffins, and all sorts of things not known to the boy. They both were tired, but were very hungry. Joe lay down that night in a barn with clean hay for his bed. The sweet smell of it was good, and he slept in more comfort than he had in months. The meal and friendship gave him a warm glow that lasted through night into morning. He woke happy and refreshed, ready for work. When the farmer came out on his porch, Joe stood, already washed and anxious to begin the day. They led the livestock to pasture and returned for their morning meal. Having eaten, they began the farm day. Their hours passed quickly and too soon, it seemed. Supper was done. Again, the boy lay in the fragrant hay. Before sleep came, he watched a spider weave its web. The little creature worked so precisely that Joe became fascinated by its motions. It first strung a silken thread from an overhead beam. Climbing back to the middle of this thread, it sat and waited for a breeze. When one came, it blew the insect across to a pitchfork handle that stood up from a bale of hay. There the spider attached its line and crept back to the center. Continuing this, it soon had a pattern of silk that looked like, a wagon, looked like wagon wheel spokes. This part completed, it hopped from spoke to spoke, spinning cross members in a circular pattern. Joe watched the spider calculate and measure as it went. Each circle was almost perfectly spaced from the one made before it. The spider finished and sat quietly to wait for its supper. Soon, a small moth bumbled into the glistening, nearly invisible net. The spider raced in. Supper was ready. The boy watched as the spider ate, and he reflected. All creatures had a way to get their meals. Even the spider spun its trap each night, for that was the way it found food. Only I, thought the boy, have not found my way. Should I be Indian? Should I load boxes? Should I farm? Where would Joe finally find the right way for his life? These were the thoughts that occupied his mind as he dozed into sleep. When he woke, the spider had taken down its web and was gone. It had left to sleep in a hidden place until dusk called it out again. Joe envied it for the, its routine that its life held. The next morning, Joe rose, washed, and again joined in the farm work for his keep. He felt that this life would satisfy him, but he knew enough of farming to see that harvest time would come soon. After the harvest, Joe knew from all his own experience farm work would be slow and help would not be needed. The boy didn't need to be told that by September or October he would not be a help to this family but a drain on it. 
He decided that this would also be the case with Tony's uncle. On that farm, he would not even have helped with the summer work. He would be unwanted at best. The idea of Haven that had occupied him during his trip from New York evaporated like morning fog. He would soon be alone again. He wasn't worried about food. He still had money and knew how to live off the land, if need be. His worry was a different thing. It was made up of winter, loneliness, and other concepts not fully formed, like clouds in his mind. He thought that it would be wonderful indeed to own a farm some day and build a log house with a fireplace where he could keep a dog, perhaps, for company. But as few silver dollars would never buy land. Even if he had enough money, he was a hunted criminal who could not settle in one place. He would have to move on. Each day the sun set farther to the south, and Joe knew it would soon make the crooked walk of winter. He worked with the farmer through the waning days of autumn into Indian summer. One day all was done. The crops were harvested. The fodder was ready for the animals. The farm season was ended. The small amounts of winter work could easily be handled by one man. That night, the young boy gathered a few belongings into his rag bundle. In the hayloft, he prepared a spot for sleeping and, curling up there, began to cry. At some time during the darkness, he fell asleep. Morning came, and he ate with the family. He told them he would move on now, and they agreed. The boy thanked them for their food and kindness.